We are now in chapter 2 of Discovering the True Church, written by Father Agustin Torrentino, published in 2022 by St. Paul's. The second chapter is entitled, The Purpose of the Church. It begins with the phenomenon of religions, so very interesting, uh, going, you, you may say, moving backward uh, before talking about the true church, the author moves backward. And why are there religions in the first place? And then he, he goes on, he continues with the revealed religion that God revealed himself and God himself uh, instructed uh, Moses actually to start what eventually became Judaism. From there we see that God wants an institutional religion. And then uh, at the appropriate time, in God's time, God became man, Jesus Christ, and he founded his church to save all men. And this uh, true church, this uh, church of, of, uh, of the Savior, uh, it is actually, it is not a break but as we will discuss it, it is a continuation of what God already began before through Moses. And then the author finally uh, answered the purpose of this church, uh, the church founded by Jesus Christ, in number four, prepared by Yahweh, by God himself, in number two and number three, that all uh, that this uh, church is meant for the salvation of souls of people okay so the first section phenomenon of religions uh, very interesting why are there religions so the answer is there are religions because the desire for god is written in the human heart because man is created by God and for God. And God never ceases to draw man to himself. So there is that deep-seated, uh, very innate desire for God in man. So he, he longs for God. And God himself, well, be, uh, well uh, you can say uh, precisely because God wants to, to draw man to himself, he put that desire in man's heart. But not only that, God himself is, uh, is you may say, finding ways, uh, one of which is put in the side, but, but finding other ways, doing other things in order to draw man to himself. In many ways throughout history down to the present day, men have given different, exp given expression to their quest for God in their religious beliefs and behavior. These forms of religious expression are so universal that one may well call man a religious being. So, here, historically, in the different centuries, in the different uh, places, we can find that man has searched for God in many different ways. From the earliest history of mankind, there's, there had already been that search for God. Well, that search for God, you may say, is upward. So from man to God. So that upward search led to the different ideas about God. Uh, and, and that is the reason why there are many religions. So for example, some believe that there is only one God, monotheism. So you have you have the uh, Abrahamic religions, uh, you have the Judaism, you have Islam, you have Christianity. So these are monotheistic religions. While others think that there are many gods. So you have Hinduism, you have many other uh, polytheistic religions in the history of, of mankind. However, both beliefs cannot be both true, since obviously contrary propositions cannot 
both be true in the same sense and at the same time. Meaning, if one is God, then he is not many. If he is many, if they are many, then he is not one God. In other words, there are different religions because there are different beliefs. That's why to say that all religions are the same, well, <laughs> it's, not, it's not correct. Uh, it's, it's an error called religious indifferentism. If, if there's only one, one belief, so there should only be one religion. But the fact is, since different people believe different things, so there are different religions. Uh, so this is the, the problem with the upward approach. So there is this uh, critic, Ludwig Feuerbach, uh, and he criticized the believers saying that the God, quote-unquote God, that the believers believe in was nothing but more than nothing more than man's self-projection. So it's just man's projection of himself what he calls, quote-unquote, God. So, in the upward approach, man can only guess. So, he may speculate in a very articulate way, but in the final analysis, it's a blind search for God. Very open to errors and very uh, dangerous errors. In fact, historically, this is, there is what you call the Aztecs. So the, the conjectures, the guesses, sometimes they are deadly. So like what happened to these uh, to these Aztecs, about 250,000 persons were offered as human sacrifices because of the erroneous belief that the gods needed the victim's blood and physical hearts. That's, uh, very dangerous. Fortunately, now we go to the second section. Fortunately. God revealed himself. Okay, so uh, you don't need to keep on guessing who God is. It's like God, God telling man. Huh? You don't need to keep on guessing who I am. I will reveal myself to you. So like, uh, uh, you, you know, if, if you turn an, an exam, so the teacher is already giving the answer key. So who is God? Well, let God introduce himself. So this downward approach <clears throat> from God to man happened in the span of several centuries. So it's not a one-time, big-time thing. But uh, little by little, there's like a development or progression in the revelation of God. In the first pages of the book of Genesis there, we already read that God walked in the Garden of Eden. So there. God is already revealing himself. In the book of Exodus, God would talk to Moses face to face. To face. He entered into a covenant. So, you know, this face to face covenant. He entered into a covenant with the Israelites, making them his people and he their God. He would go ahead of them in a pillar of cloud by day. And a pillar of fire by night. So there, no? So from all of this initially, so this is just an initial uh, like analysis, we can already arrive at certain conclusions about the nature of God. So for example, so we realize that He is a personal being. So He is not an energy or a force or whatever. He is a personal being. That's why he, he enters into a covenant. He, you, you can talk to him. Moses would talk to him face to face. So he's a personal being. And he is distinct from creation. <clears throat> Therefore, we can already say that, you know, pantheism is actually, new age is incorrect. We also see that he is good. Therefore, well, he does not need human sacrifices. So, so these are you may say initial revelations in the first uh, two books of the of the uh, Bible revealing the nature of God. 
Well, all these uh, partial revelations in the Old Testament were completed by Jesus in the New Testament when finally God did not only, you know, uh, send messages or this and that, but God decided to become man and live with men. And and there, he, he revealed everything. Com- the completion of the revelation. He lived with men for some 30 plus years, telling them, teaching them everything they needed to know in order to attain salvation. In Exodus, In Exodus, we discovered that God wants an institutional religion. So this is part of the revelation of God to Moses. And and God wants that men should not only worship Him, like individually, personally. God wants men to worship Him as a community. That's why religion is not just something private, but also public. So so it's it's a group activity. It's, It's a... Yeah... It's not just something you may say personal uh, thing, private thing. No, it's it's a public uh, activity. Here now is the revelation of uh, of God, little by little, how He wants uh, worship to be done. How, yeah, the the dealings with with God. So here is a a possible uh, illustration of the Ark of the Covenant. So Yahweh, in a detailed way, instructed Moses how to build the Ark of the Covenant, specifying the kind of wood to be used. God wanted that images of cherubim to be carved on it. So two two angels like uh, facing each other, bowing uh, as if covering the Ark of the Covenant. So this is an instruction of God himself. He also described the table, the lampstand, the tent cloth, the wooden walls. He indicated that there should be an altar of holocausts. God wanted that on this altar, there should be offerings, different offerings. So burnt offering, brain, peace, sin, guilt offering. Well, by their names, you already understand what they are for. So sin offering is for the atonement of sins. Uh, Peace offering, well, for peace, etc., All this imply that man should not invent how God must be worshipped. So that, that, that's very important. If God wants a communal activity, then man should follow that divine will. <clears throat> we cannot invent of how God should be worshipped because God is already telling us how to do it. That's why in this context, one wonders whether... Well, whether God really wants you know, loud music in a worship service that looks more like a concert than an authentic divine worship. So sometimes some people would ask, is it really, is this concert really for God or for the good feelings, for the entertainment of man? Is God really happy or does he receive worship in that way? I don't know. Uh, so there, no, not to invent, not to invent in the way of worshiping God, uh, but to follow what He actually revealed. Uh, some people are very critical of traditional worship. They they say that well, it's ritualistic, ritual. But <laughs> but if you read the the Bible, where you ask, but where did those uh, rituals, those rites, come from? altar of holocaust, burnt offering, etc. Well, they came from God. So what Jesus censured was the absence of interiority when performing the Jewish rites. So the rites themselves, they're not wrong. They came from Yahweh. So Jesus was uh, like um, uh, censuring the people and quoting uh, Isaiah. He said, these people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me. So, it's not the rites themselves, but the interiority in doing those rites. That those rites should be the external manifestation of what is inside. If I'm offering uh, a sin offering, so I should be 
sorry for what I have done because I'm asking for pardon from God. But if I'm just doing it mechanically, well, understandably, uh, God does not like that. One very clear, um, you may say, uh, proof that the rights themselves are not wrong is that Jesus himself celebrated the Jewish Passover rites. If it were wrong, why would Jesus do it? In fact, in fact, he raised the Jewish Passover to its fullness by instituting the Holy Mass. So, he made use of an existing Jewish rite, raised it higher, completed it, reaching its fullness by instituting the Holy Mass. When he sacrificed himself, the image represented by the animal lamb reached its full meaning in the Lamb of God. These are all rites. So, in an instruction to Moses, he was told, so you have to look for a lamb, uh, not older than one year old, the lamb should be uh, this and that, it should have these qualities, etc. And what happened to that lamb? That lamb became the lamb of God. So, you see, the rites themselves are not wrong. He completed, Jesus completed, what was only foreshadowed in the Old Testament. And then the letter to the Hebrews, like... Uh, putting special emphasis on the sacrifice on the cross he said that the author said he has no need Jesus Christ has no need to offer sacrifice day after day first for his own sins and then for those of the people he did he did that once for all when he offered himself well so that's why the animal sacrifices are no longer done because the fullness of that, the, the, the Lamb, is no longer offered because now we offer the Lamb of God. Well, we don't offer, but we, we uh, make it present precisely. That's what the Holy Mass is, which is the discussion now. So the offering, the sacrifice on the cross, is renewed and perpetuated in the Holy Mass following His commandment, do this in memory of me. So, contrary to the misinformed criticism of certain groups, Christ does not die again in each Mass. Instead, the Eucharist represents, makes present the sacrifice of the cross. So, what is offered to God is no longer the animal lamb, but now the lamb of God, Jesus. But is he sacrificed uh, every day? Is he sacrificed? Th does he die every day? Well, no. He does not die every day. So what happens is his one and only death that happened in Jerusalem in Calvary in Calvary is made present. Made present. What does that mean? Transcending time and space location, that sacrifice that happened historically two thousand years ago is happening, present tense, is happening in the mass. Is made present so it's not a repetition but rather bringing it to the present that event because the actions of God are not bound by time we will discuss it more in the next slide or slides so there the mass is not simply a commemoration just like the remembrance of results that every December 30 so Every December 30, we simply commemorate the death of Rizal because that one is already finished in 1896. His, uh, his death was already finished. So every December 30, people gather in the simply just to commemorate. You cannot bring 1896 to 2022. No, it's different. So 2022, Rizal does not die again. But in God... Everything is present. The actions of God are not bound by time, but is above time. That's why the sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. So it's not, it's not a commemoration only, but it is making present what happened 2,000 years ago.
When Jesus Christ founded the Catholic Church, He did not destroy Judaism. So, so what Jesus Christ, so we are now in the fourth section, which is Jesus Christ founded His Church to save all men. Uh, what, what Jesus Christ did with the rites, with the way to worship God by instituting the Holy Mass and that the death of Jesus Christ is perpetuated, made present in each Catholic Mass, He also did it when it comes to uh, religion. So, He did not destroy Judaism. In fact, in His plan, in God's plan, Judaism was a preparation, was a preparation for the full religion, for the full church, which is the Catholic Church. He completed Judaism and made it universal. So there's a clear continuity between Judaism and Christianity because, well, Jesus himself belonged to Judaism. As a proof of this, he even that he was a, he was a Jew, he even celebrated the Passover and chose to die on the day of the Passover to show to the world that he is the new lamb. Very beautiful. You see how divine providence works. So there are many preparations in the Old Testament, this and that. And then when the fullness of time came, there. Uh, God would choose uh, this moment, this activity that he had been preparing actually for centuries and centuries. Why are there Passover rites in the Old Testament? Well, because Jesus Christ will die on that day. Why, 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 are, why is uh, there a lamb? Well, because he will be the new lamb of God. So you see the continuity. And, and, and actually the wisdom of God. Yeah, of course, no? obviously God is really wise. Now, only Jesus, because He is God, can complete the true religion that began with Judaism. So not just anybody can reform what God has founded. So, after all, who is man to correct God and improve His divine work? Well, God made a mistake. I will correct it. Well, wait a minute. But uh, who who do you think you are? Who who are you? Uh, are you are you God? Only God. Jesus Christ is God, and that's why He can complete. He can improve on Judaism, uh, which is what He did by founding His uh, His religion, His truth, His uh, the Catholic Church. There are some who say that a church is unnecessary. According to them, one's personal relationship with Jesus is enough. But the big question mark here that practically, you know, that shouts is, why would Jesus found a church if it were unnecessary? Who is man to say, <laughs> who is man to say that Jesus you know, made a mistake. It, it's, it's short of saying, well, you did not need to found a church. In fact, only personal relationship with you is, is the only thing necessary. Well, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, do they know better than Jesus? Probably they want to teach him what to do, what not to do, whether to found or not to found a useful or a useless, a useless church. Is uh, quite uh, an arrogant attitude, which is uh, strongly condemned in the Bible. Who is man to teach God? But who indeed are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Letter to the Romans 9.20 Will one who argues with the Almighty be corrected? Let him who would instruct God give answer. Job 40.2 Jesus Christ founded His church in order to continue His work of salvation, in order to continue whatever was begun in the Old Testament, covenant, uh, relationship with God. 
So the church founded by Jesus Christ is both for the worship of God, Passover, uh, Holy Mass, and for the eternal union with Him in heaven, salvation. Because what's the point of all this worshiping and this and that if at the end of the day, the person does not go to heaven? All this personal relationship that has begun uh, earlier on earth will be cut off later on. We will It will appear in, in another slide uh, much later. Having a proper relationship with Him begins on earth and continues forever in heaven. So the, the covenant, the, the personal relationship, very good. It, it begins here and it continues forever in heaven. But we have to reach heaven. And that's why, because of God's love for men, He became man to save us. Salvation is from the Jews. That's what John 4.22 says. But God wants everyone to be saved. Romans 1.16 So that is why uh, Jesus commanded the disciples to go to all nations, not just one nation, not just because he wants everybody to be saved, to benefit from his work of salvation. That's why a religion that caters to a specific group only, for example, the, the Anglicans, which is actually for, for the English only, Aglipayans, for the Filipinos only, uh, that's what... Uh, actually, the founder of the Aglipayan, we will see in the later chapter, is Isabello de los Reyes, not, not really Gregorio Aglipay, but since Isabello was not a priest, so he needed a, a priest. So, uh, so that's why uh, Gregorio, Gregorio Aglipay entered the picture. Anyway, what they said so, uh, was that they, they wanted a church that is uh, for the Filipinos and governed by the Filipinos. So, uh, well, if it's a religion that caters only to one specific group, it cannot be the true church very clearly. God does not intend to save the English only, or the Filipinos only, but the whole world. Not only the British, not only the, the Asians, no, but the whole world. For this reason, the Catholic Church is present everywhere, not just in one city or in one country. Also, in terms of time, God does not intend to save only those who live in the first century. He wants to save all men of all time. So, those who are alive in the 21st century, those who are alive in the 25th century, those who are alive in the 30th century, in all the time. He wants to save all, because Jesus Christ is the Savior of all. Therefore, the true church must have been present from the time of Jesus 20 centuries ago up to the present time, continuously, without any disappearance, reappearance, and up to the end of time. So, because if, if Jesus were to save uh, everyone from, from the first century up to the end, I don't know what is the, when is the end, uh, if it's... Uh, 50th century, so so that church should be existing from day one, from first century up to the end, without interruption, because if there will be an interruption, what happens to the work of salvation? Who will teach them about Jesus Christ? Who will help them to get to know about the saving work of Jesus? That's why the Catholic Church established by Christ as a communion of life, charity, and truth. It is also used by Him as an instrument for the redemption of all. So the Catholic Church is the instrument for the redemption of everyone. For it is through Christ's Catholic Church alone, which is the universal help toward salvation, that the fullness of the means of salvation can be obtained. So there, uh, there are means 
that are very necessary, for example, baptism, in order to be saved. So the universal help so that people can be saved. Uh, well, these helps, they are available. This means they are available in the Catholic Church. For example, uh, the sacraments, baptism, etc. And the uh, doctrine, the, the truth, uh, the truth about heaven, the truth about God, that there are three persons in one God. So all these, uh, all these helps are available in the Catholic Church. It was to the Apostolic College alone, of which Peter is the head, that we believe that our Lord entrusted all the blessings of the new covenant in order to establish on earth the one body of Christ into which all those should be fully incorporated who belong in any way to the people of God. Okay, so, well, it is true that the Catholic Church has a long history of prayer life. No question about that. You, can, you, you, you will find out uh, the writings, the, the prayers, the considerations of the Desert Fathers in the, as early as the 3rd century. A very, very deep personal relationship with God. Okay? That's true in all the centuries, even up to the present. In the 16th century, there was like a special group of people. They're called the mystics. Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, etc. So they have, they have reached a, a very high, high level of union with God through prayer. So, so the Catholic Church has a very long history of prayer life, of, deep, of a deep relationship with God. The Catholic Church also has always been, even up to the present, the biggest worldwide charitable institution from the early centuries up to the present. However, the Catholic Church is not only about charity. If the Catholic Church was meant to be a prayer group, quote-unquote, a prayer group or a charitable institution or similar things, only, only, or primarily, then the sufferings of Jesus are, you know, cheap and somehow devalued. Religious masters were able to teach sublime prayer without going through Calvary. Philanthropists were able to help without being scourged a pillar. But Jesus was willing to die on the cross primarily for salvation and nothing less than salvation. And don't think that salvation is, you know, I, I just reached the, I, I crossed the finish line and, you know, uh, I'm already in heaven. <laughs> it's not as simple as that. Uh, very soon we will discuss what is what, what, what heaven is. So, salvation is equal to heaven, equal to eternal life. And it's not a very small thing. And that's why he founded the Catholic Church, to continue this work of salvation. Precisely this, what is salvation? What does being saved mean? Being saved from what? Salvation means being saved from hell. Now, our Lord uh, talked about hell so many times, more than what we might uh, think of. You know, just studying one of the four Gospels, just the Gospel of Matthew, he talked about hell as many as 12 times, at least 12 times. And you know, the Gospel of Matthew has only uh, 28 chapters. So, first two chapters are about the infancy. Chapter 26, 27, 28, about the passion, death, and resurrection, and ascension. So if you remove 5 from 28, you're left with 23. So if our Lord talked about hell 12 times, you can say that mathematically, he was talking about hell every other chapter. So he talked a lot about hell, actually. For example, he said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than with the two hands to go into Gehenna, into that unquenchable fire where their worm does not die. He also said that the damned 
will be thrown into the fiery furnace where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Conversely, well, if, if one is saved from hell, it means going to heaven. So what is heaven? Heaven is the state of eternal union with God. It is the ultimate end and fulfillment of the deepest human longings, the state of supreme definitive happiness. Uh, it, it's a place where you, you, you don't need anything else. You are completely satisfied, completely happy. All the deepest longings that you have. Sometimes you are happy when, or sometimes we are longing for delicious uh, lunch, uh, or this and that, or, or a nice clue. But after some time, we get, you know, we get we get tired of, of these things. And but in heaven, we will not get tired. We are just happy all the time. It is enjoying the beatific vision of God, seeing Him face to face. And here, it is the completion, perfection, and perpetuation of the personal relationship knowing, loving, serving God that began on earth. That's heaven. That's heaven. Personal relationship? Yes, yes, yes. It's not wrong. But we have to get to heaven. We have to get to heaven. And that's why if one does not reach heaven, this personal relationship is cut off forever. One is permanently saved once he reached heaven, not earlier, as falsely promised by some sects. So, the person has to reach heaven. Only then will he be completely uh, saved, as we have already considered in the introduction. Now, a very important question is, how do I know that the follower of this or that religion actually reached heaven. For example, if it's true that the Mormons will be saved, or any other group, but anyway, just an example, we have to ask if they can prove that any Mormon, especially Joseph Smith, their founder, is actually in heaven. The Catholic Church, through a series of human investigations and divine interventions, is able to know if a person is actually in heaven, we'll discuss this in section 8.2. But the Catholic Church can, can prove that a person, a Catholic, is actually in heaven. Once proven that someone has reached heaven, the rest of us could just walk on that tested path. Because why would a person, why would you risk treading on untested paths? This is the end of chapter 2 of the book Discovering the True Church. Thank you for listening.